This conference will now be recorded. I don't want to be recorded. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, like I said, this isn't a structured thing. It's more of an informal Q&A um, just to get some input and questions and things like that. So, I guess anybody that feels froggy, go ahead and jump. First, I guess we should introduce ourselves. I'm Brian. And uh, Assam, I'll let you go, and then we'll let everybody else, I guess. Perfect. I'm awesome. I'm, I guess, get grandfathered in with the Nova 2460 by before I got to learn about the Laser USA team. And I've been working with them and testing some stuff out for them. And Gary, you're on here, right? Yep. Yeah, I'm Gary Wyatt. Uh, I'm a sign shop. and. Shippenville, Pennsylvania. I uh, just got my Nova 35 100 watt in uh, mid January. Cool, cool. And of course, Mark is here. Hi, Brian. Hi, everybody. Yeah, Mark was ours, Hubertus, Wisconsin, retired, have a Nova 24. Awesome. You guys need to turn your cameras on so I can see what you look like. <laughs> Nobody yeah. wants that. I've been holed up in my garage for in the I'm sorry the U.S. Support and Innovation Labs for uh, <laughs> since last December. So you, you know I look like Bigfoot, but uh, <laughs> so and I see Pam is on here. It looks like the microphone's muted. Um, there's a way that you could call in if you want or if you just oh I see there you are. Looks like yeah, you I did. I did. I have a dog here at home with me, and sometimes she decides the squirrels are too close. So I hate oh. to. Leave it well, open all the time. I do the same thing when I see a squirrel. I'm I'm pretty ADHD, <laughs> so yeah, the dog's welcome. So, and Pam, um, tell us about yourself real quick and your machine. Sure. Um, I live um outside of Philadelphia, and I have a Nova 35 80 watt um that I've had for about two and a half, three weeks. Awesome. So I'm really new, but I have cut some stuff with it. Thank awesome. goodness. That, that's the model I have, by the way, too. I've got a 3580. So, Great. Um, all right. So, you know, again, there's no structure. So if you have any questions or if we want to work on a design or just kind of play with stuff, um, if you can figure out how to share your screen, uh, you're welcome to take over and, and drive. So it's just going to be a little round table about, I guess, mostly the light burn basics. Um, so if anybody's got anything, I'm game. I'd like to know about how to start the process to engrave a photograph. I'd like to know as much information about that as possible because um, I haven't really uh, tried it and uh, I need to know how to do it. Oh boy, okay. Um, <laughs> I was gonna specifically exclude imaging. <laughs> oh, okay, For never him. mind. Um, I, I can <laughs> tell you what I've learned. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go for it, Gary. Let's let's hear your feedback on it. Let's let's run with it. It's a little bit more of an advanced um, thing, but yeah, let's let's do it. I uh, I have found that a good photograph makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> um, I started out using the Big Gimpin plug-in, which I think works fine. But I've had some people on the Lightburn forum been trying to teach me how to manually adjust, which I think in the end will be the best because then you can tweak what you want to tweak and not what the plugin wants you to tweak. Right. Um, Plus you learn the, the photos just by doing that. You learn right. about that and you can learn to start picking out better photos based on how they look before you even start processing them. Yeah. Right. And I was talking to Chris this morning and he was telling me how he was using Photoshop and he has a he has a uh, video on how he preps his photos, and he gets way more involved than what I have gotten so far. But what I have done, um, I've found good settings thanks to thanks to Travis on the Lightburn forum. And when you pull up your photo, um, I forget what they call it now. You were uh, Photo properties or show properties of the image. Right. Um, the basic settings that I've been using a lot is 
setting your gamma anywhere from 0.65 to 0.8. Gotcha. The enhanced radius to four ish. Let's uh. Yeah, pull a photo in there, Brian. Um, I'm just gonna pick something at random. No, not that one. Uh not that random. Or, <laughs> so, oh, the cut. blinding one. The blinding one, yeah. So we're, we're at grayscale, and back then out, back out of that. Here. Back out, yeah. Shape properties are over here, and also, yeah. guys, if you don't see something in your windows, like shape properties, for instance, it may not be checked by default. Um, you can add those tabs. Uh, just by going up here and then selecting what you want to show and you can dock them in different places after you get it pulled up uh, You can undock them. You can put them down here. You can put them separately. So there's there are ways to move that stuff around Sorry, Gary. There's your shape properties <laughs> Yeah, so set your gamma to like pull up something just like get on Google and get a picture of a horse or okay. a deer or something so it has Brian, you still got a picture of that dog? That you could just use that. Yeah, that anything. What dog? The one we used last time. The Labrador, or what was that? Yeah, I gotta find it. Oh, never mind. Then just do what you've been told to do. Sorry. Uh, I was just gonna look for a horse. Well, uh, <clears throat> what did you say the enhanced radius should be set at? Oh, I've been setting mine at like four. Gary, you want something without a lot of contrast? You do want yeah, something with a background no. to show. Like that third one in, that horse or the third one, any of them right there. Just so it isn't like a white background. Yeah, that'll work great. Can I go into your enhance? There you go. I'll set gamma to 0.8. If Chris was here, he'd really be the oh, one to. My num lock didn't work. Okay. Now, can you see the um, difference in the preview when you're doing this? Uh, I just go run through it and then I check it. Because I didn't know if it's as you make those changes, if if it's actually um. It'll, you'll see it live on screen. Yeah. Another thing, guys, if you're working in grayscale, if you don't have shade according to power turned on, you're going to get a big black box. So don't get scared. Uh, turn your shade according to power on, and that way you'll be able to see a little better what's going on. Okay, so anyway, uh, gamma is 0.8. Yep. Then go down to your radio, your enhanced radius. Set that at four. Okay. Set your enhanced amount to 200 to start. Okay. Oh, I see it. It and made then, a difference right there yeah. on the image in real time. Okay. Yeah. Now yeah. you can take your your. That's I would, the thing. There's unsharp. nothing real white right there, so right. I would brighten up that. I would uh -huh. turn the brightness up to start getting lighten that up some, so you have more of a range. Right. Oh, stop. Back up a couple there. See how his feet are starting to blow out? Yeah. Go as far as you can go without With that blowing out. Ooh, that's getting pretty close, kinda. Yep, that looks good. Like my around. And then there. go to, oh. Yeah, go to your contrast. You want it down? And you can you can adjust your contrast a little bit. I'd go up maybe. Now, now the uh the enhanced radius is Oops. the same as unsharp mask, right? Yeah, I would come back a little bit cuz the background's getting blown out. You hear me? You know, I've had times that the contrast has been pretty good on some photos. Yeah. Now that other times it was pretty crappy. Did, but. did you hear what I asked Gary about the enhance radius? Yes, it's like an unsharp mask. That is the that is the sharp. Okay, the unsharp mask. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you go into your image, yeah, into your uh, into your image on your cut 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 layers, double click that. Now, you need to know what your dot size is. If you're using a standard two inch lens, that I believe the one we get with our lasers are two inch, right? Yeah. Uh huh. So typically, that you want to stay right in around 0.8 for your overlap or your 0.8 or 
point eight or point oh eight? Point oh eight. Point eight. Point eight. Uh, okay. No, I'm sorry. Point oh eight. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say point eight's a little fat there, man. Yeah. Point oh eight. Well, and then you you want to uh, set your your image mode to Jarvis is the one that Chris has been telling me seems like the best. And make sure you have your power set as about as low as what your power, your laser will fire. Mine's 10 on my 100 watt. And then my speed, I've been running right in around 150. Okay, so quite a bit slower than you would think. Yeah. And uh, how do you tell? How do you determine that, what your lowest power is that you that your uh, laser will fire? You you. I just start turning mine down. Yeah, you just pulse it. You do it at the control panel, or you can do it from Lightburn if you want. But uh, oh, okay. at the control panel until it just doesn't fire anymore, and then okay, then you're pretty close. You just got to find your own threshold there. I was gonna say that. Oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna say there's uh, the power setting file. I would recommend running that. At least I'll give you an idea. Right. Yeah, that's how I found mine out. I was running a, a scale, and it just got down to where it just quit cutting or printing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brian, you want to have your min and max the same for a regular engrave? Do you? I okay. always have. Okay. If you're going 3D, then you do. Then you then you have that range, yeah, or yeah. Right. So 150, 10, and 10, or do you do you burn it a little yeah. hotter than that? Of course, you yeah, got 100. 10 and 10. Yeah. And no, no air assist? Um, well, very little. Just a little bit of air assist. When air assist is off on the, on the ones with two stage air, when air assist is turned off, you get the engraved stage. If air right. assist is on, it's the cut stage. So, correct. Air assist needs to be off for engraving. You're still going to get air, just just lower if you have it set right on the, on the panel. Okay. Um, Nova 24, I don't think it matters unless you've got the dual stage. None of them matter unless you have the dual stage. If you don't have dual stage, on is on and off is off. If if you have dual stage, off is engrave air, engrave stage, and on is cut stage. I don't think there's really a difference in those either. Is there, Brian? It's just you well, can have your Dallas well, preset. No, that's the needle valves on the front. You Those green buttons that are there, you push one. One's cut, one's engrave. And you, right, like, for instance. really not. One doesn't restrict more than the other. It just lets you preset a valve where you want it. Basically, yeah, yeah. You you set the, you set the flows ahead of time. You know, so you'll set your engraved flow and feel it until you just get a little bit of air out. You just want a, a you know a dispersed flow of air, just a whiff, not so much a jet like you do when you're cutting. So that's what the needle valves are for. Yeah, but it's not <laughs> continuously variable in the program. No. Gary, just... I, I have a question for you. Um, now you the, you've got this image all prepared, ready to go. Uh, what have you found um, as far as quality on various types of woods? Uh, I see some of the forums say you know cherry wood works really well, um, and uh, walnut doesn't work, and paper works, and you know and so on and so forth. What do you use? I use basswood, which the reason I like it is because it's probably softer, but if you look at um, like Michael's or Joanne Fabrics, they have the live edge pieces. You know, there's a, either you can get the round discs with the live wedge all the way around, or you can get the slabs with the live edge on the top and the bottom. And it just adds something to the image instead of just cutting out a cutting board. You know, you can actually have live edge on it, and it just looks sharper, I think. Okay. So that's cool. I might try a few images now. Now, what <laughs> about what about if you bypass? Um, well, that's I don't guess you'd need to use bypass unless you edited it outside. So yeah, that wouldn't Correct. even be. A, I want to see something. I want to see what happens when it tries to trace that thing. I think I do. I might have just messed up. Did it trace? I'm trying to connect through my phone or my my computer. Sketch trace. 
I'm just kind of playing around now, seeing if I can get an outline of the horse. So, yeah, that's not going to work too good. Um, is there anything else on this image? No, I'm connected with Ethernet, um, and I've noticed that uh, when I tried sending an uh, image to it, it took a long time to, to download. Is that normal? Um, yeah, it can be. So, uh, and that's using start, or are you sending it? You're sending it to the controller? Sending, correct. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess it could take a little bit, um, depending on... Let me see if I got a bunch of. Oh, I need to delete mine. It's always good to delete those if you do a lot of sending, unless you're going to use them. Um, Mark, yeah. always it, de it depends on the size of the picture. Of course, if you have like three lines and you download them or send them, it'll go much faster than an actual image. Right. So yeah, always expect that. Uh, I do a lot of network stuff too, and people always tend to forget. Like, why is this page not opening? Well, you've got 300 megs coming down on your two meg pipeline what do you think is going to happen yeah and i don't know how the actual file size the light burn file size correlates with the packet size that's actually sent when it processes it you know so that it can talk in ruida i haven't looked at those packets to see how big they are i guess once you send it over to the machine you'll know let me send it over there and have a look Um, yes. I, I have right a question while that's, while that's doing that. Um, is, is there a way to save the actual Ruida file anywhere so you don't have to recompile when you send an image? Yes. Let's say you wanted to do that one uh, two months from now. Sure. So you can put your thumb drive in your computer. I'm going to kill this for a minute. It's taking forever. It won't let no, me. No, that's go. 37 megs. That's why. Yeah. So see the save RD file here? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, you can save to a thumb drive and that will be in that in that format and you can either put it back in Lightburn and run it or you can plug the thumb drive right into the U disk port on your laser and pull it right up in the control panel from the U drive. Okay, if you're if you're not using a thumb drive, can can you save uh, the RD file to a, a, a hard drive somewhere? You can. Okay, sure. Yeah, you can save it in any digital format you want, but to get it back to the laser without using another program like RD Works or Lightburn in this case, you know, to run one, um, you'll have to, you know, just get it to a USB stick eventually to get it right into the laser because that's, it reads flash memory. It's got a flash memory port right on the side. Okay, good. Hey, Brian, uh, what's the RD file all about? The what? What's this RD file for? Which one? No, right there. What, right there? What's RD? Uh, that's the RD works. That's the format that the controller actually understands. So when Lightburn processes this image and sends the, the data to the machine, it has to convert it uh, to the RD works uh, language, so to speak. So like you can click save as RD file and it'll let me save this as an RD file um, wherever I want. And then I can put that on a thumb drive and plug it right into the laser and pull it up in the controller because it's already in Ruida's native format. But when you send it to the controller through the send, doesn't it just stay there in the memory unless you delete the file? It stays in memory unless you delete the file, right. So, so why wouldn't you basically. just use that feature? Well, what if you're working on one at, at work and you're not connected to your laser or something, you know, and you want to save it on a thumb drive and run downstairs and run it real quick without having to hook your computer up and all that. Oh, so, gotcha. Okay, makes sense now. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, also, you know, we talk about using send a lot because it's a little bit more reliable sometimes than sending those packets, you know, streaming. When you start, you can hold down the shift key and hit send, and it's just like hitting start. It's different than just hitting send in the fact that it'll go ahead and start the machine and start the process. You don't have to go into the file menu and pull it up and preview it and then hit enter. So you can actually hold down shift and hit send, and it works the same as the start button, except it does send the file physically to the controller. Oh, wow. So it actually will send it and start the job right away. Correct. Uh, I still like to do the uh, check to make sure I'm in the right bounds of where I am before I yeah. start. Yeah. yeah. So and I, I mostly use absolute coordinates, but when I do use user position or current position, I always like to set my origin over there and double check, like you say, especially with tumblers and doing weird stuff. So. Um, hey, Mark. Go ahead. Um, 
I I've, I've been using Ethernet to send my files also. But recently, I've, and I think something's jacked up with my network itself. Today, I couldn't get any photo to send. I could get any vector image to send, but no photos. Brian recommended trying to run through the USB, you know, unplugging my camera, run through the USB. And when I did, I, I did that, I could get anything to send. Everything sent well through the USB packet, even files that were huge that yeah. would not send prior through the Ethernet. So I'm yeah. switching everything over to USB for now. Yeah, and that happens. I mean, every environment's a little different, and there's going to be those caveats to each setup. And, but, you know, historically, Ethernet is more reliable, uh, but sometimes that's not the case, depending on your situation. Well, so, I, I think I, I just posted something recently about the initial configuration using the dot one dot one hundred. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a heck of a time. The thing would it would lose connection periodically. I wouldn't it would, uh, just would disappear. Right. And, uh, and and I found that was a address conflict. Right. Yeah. So that's something you got to watch out for. You know, most of the time in all of our demonstrations and even in the manual, it's showing 192.168.1.1 is what you should call the IP on your on your LAN port on your PC. But that's a gateway address normally. So if you have another network card or another network on your computer that's in that same range, it'll absolutely start kicking stuff off. So right. there's a little uh, more to it. Than well, somebody somebody started talking about uh, a rotary a minute ago, and I I have a question now. Let's say you've got a um, I don't have my rotary yet, but mm -hmm. let's pretend I do. Um, let's say you had a a tapered glass, like a beer glass, uh -huh. and uh, so on the one end it's got a diameter of two and a half inches, and on the other end it's got a diameter of one inch. So you set your rollers up so the top of the glass is is level. Right. What do you call the circumference or or diameter for your for your settings in order to get that thing to run properly? So I don't know. You could take an average. Um, does it really matter? I mean. Well, yeah. I mean, it it kind of does. But if you have a taper, there's not a whole lot you can do about it because the circumference is going to be different all the way through. So the the best guess is just take a stab in the middle and go for it if your logo is going to be central on the cylinder. Um, if it's going to be toward the top, I would probably go with an average of that top third. You know what I mean? Just kind of getting the ballpark is about the best you can do on there. But um, I don't think, you know, a normal glass would be tapered enough to see a whole lot of of issues, you know, with the naked eye anyway, unless you got out of tape and started measuring and calipering. Yeah. So is one of those rollers uh, on one of the ends an idler and the other one is a driver? Correct. Um, I don't know if you can see. Let me, let me do something here. Actually, let me do it this way because you can see my screen. Um, I'll pull it up and show it to you. I think I will if I can get my OBS to open up. There it goes. You'll probably be able to see this a little better. Let me turn my light burn camera off. And then when you plug that that device in, does it automatically um, uh, defeat the Y axis then and convert that to rotary? Is that how that works? No, we well, we have special firmware in the Thunder controllers, in the Ruida controllers that allow us to use the U axis. So we never take the Y axis out of play. And that's kind of neat because when you get done with a cup, you can move the axis out of the way and not have to fish the cup out around the head because it doesn't have to stay in that spot. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah, we utilize a separate channel for the rotary. And when you plug it in the machine, you'll probably there's the rotary uh, connection right here. The new ones have a seven pin connection on them and there's a jumper that's built in. So when you plug them in, the, the laser recognizes that the rotary has been attached to the system. Now you still have to tell your software that. Lightburn doesn't know that you plugged it in. So you'll have to click enable rotary here. And if that's not showing up, there's a setting somewhere that will allow you to make that show up uh, in your laser panel here. <clears throat> so as far as the uh, rotary goes, it's on its side right now where you're looking at the front. 
there's the motor and it drives both of these drive wheels and there's a tensioner here that actually puts pressure on the glass to keep it against the drive roller so it doesn't slip. And then these back ones are idlers and they are on a lead screw and a, and a tower. So they move up and down just by turning that screw. So that's how you get it flat on top if it's a tapered mug. You just raise the back end up a little or lower it just to get level. And then that whole contraption sits on the honeycomb table? Correct. Is there any, uh, oh yeah, that's right, the air assist would be attached to the laser head. Okay. Here's, here's, um, here's a little bit of a taper on one. I don't know if you could hear me over there. I forgot I didn't have my laugh mic on. Uh, just barely. But okay. uh, so you would just sort of take an average of or guess what the diameter is there at uh, at the point. Yeah. You're doing if your... it was gonna, if I was going to put my logo in the center there, then I would just take that diagonal of the center of the artwork or, or that circumference at the center of the artwork probably would be the best guess. Now Brian with that rotary are you are you able to engrave ball bats? Um yeah you can remove this cap over here on the on the end and you can lay longer objects across it and let it it'll sit down in that V groove. So yeah as long okay, as the, yeah the clamp will hold on to it? I don't know if the clamp will. No, that's more just for the mugs. And you'd have to move your okay. move your you know your idlers all the way over and I can get you a measurement on this link. Well there's a tape measure right there. Yeah, the only worry on that one would be you need some sort of end to keep it from moving off. Yeah, you'd have to weight it or put a rubber band around it and around the wheels or do something. Otherwise, yeah, I mean a mini bat would work. Yeah, you know, and clamp, yeah, clamp would work for the longer ones. Uh, yeah. No, sorry, the jaw, not the clamp, sorry. So, yeah. And plus, I don't know if a 35, I guess a bat will fit in there. I don't know. I haven't tried. An AR will. <laughs> so if you wanted to do a rolling pin, would you just take that clamp off? Yeah, if you want to do a rolling pin, you would take the, the brace off of the back, the backstop for the cup. That's a backstop for the cup, and that's a tensioner for the cup. And there's just a little thumb screw that hold each of those on so they'll pop right off. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. And um, just for comparison, I'm gonna I'm gonna put into view the old rotary that we used to have. <laughs> that thing. That's what we used to have that wonderful rotary so you can see the difference <laughs> so they're neat um all right uh is there anything else that anybody wants to do well, if anybody has any other questions the the, the tip about uh, moving the bed from the from the move tab uh-huh uh that was that was really helpful oh over here yeah yeah so if you wanted to you, let's say you focused your uh let's say you dropped the head of the laser on the on the work and then you wanted to move it down six millimeters you could put that distance in the uh in that sure. dialog box right there and then hit the down arrow as long as the continuous jog is is off Right. You hit the down arrow, that bed goes down exactly whatever you told it to, to go. Sure. Yeah. That, that, yeah, I dumped into that one. But um, yeah, and then and then of course the autofocus will work. I usually like to do that over there at the machine though, because I'll hit it by accident or something, you know, and leave a rotary on there. That might not be good. But um I I think for doing regular engraving, I think the I think the autofocus is the best, but when you get doing, when you get engraving for the, or focusing for the HR head, a 0.1 millimeter is a big difference. So you wanna, 
you can move that down to you know 2.7 millimeter and be good right right but yeah then definitely focus does matter and a lot of things you know we talk about cutting all the time and cutting half inch and whether you need you know the two inch lens or the four inch lens but one thing we i think fail to mention and i don't ever think of it is you know most people are referencing their their focal point you know at the top of the material where you could theoretically uh focus two or three millimeters down into the material or in the center of the material depending on the thickness um and and get a lot better depth of cut you know because you're actually focused in the center of the material now for cutting thicker materials uh, is it better to to do it with two passes with a little less heat uh, um it or, can be the results can vary i've found making multiple passes usually increases the char a good a good am amount unless you've got some really good air external air you know running about 40 psi or something that really helps upgrade number two for me coming <laughs> so i I never used the air pump that came with the machine i've always had it hooked up to an external air compressor so i've been spoiled yeah. right from the get-go and it really works well right right yeah there there is a difference i mean there's a lot of people that still use the stock pump i still do and i've got a compressor sitting right here um but you know for that extra oomph it, it does it can make a difference especially those with the 24s wanting to cut that half inch you know that's that's a good thing so hey mark do you need to tweak to, you know tinker around with the air settings or is it pretty much set it at 40 psi and let it alone oh i don't even run it that high uh, well maybe i i am up about that high now yep um between 30 and 40 and then adjust those high and low needle valves on the top of the machine to get them where you want them and it's uh it's great yeah oh and then i have another uh comment or question i'm not sure but has anyone had any issues with the autofocus not working properly mm. mine's the only thing i've had is doing slate it wouldn't pick up the edge of the slate yeah but it was like a tapered edge Okay, well, the reason that I, I mentioned is because um, I, I had some difficulty where it wasn't sensing even a chunk of wood, and I found that there's a little adjustment knob on the right sensor yep. that uh, you can just, mine was uh, turned all the way to the right, and I just backed it off a little bit and found out how it, how it worked, and it was, easily to, it was easy to readjust. Yeah, there is a gain adjustment on that uh on that sensor on the receptor so um that that is something that we have people do sometimes um to get it to work reliably and then of course you might have to reset your stop ring you know and i think yes, you did I, that i did that yep. yeah mm -hmm. oh i didn't know that i just took the dan sensor off and been using it the manual focus method works every time <laughs> you'll have to put it back on there now <laughs> no i'm not <laughs> So, yeah, and, and you know, here, all my years in lasers, everybody's always said autofocus is crap. Don't use the autofocus, just manually focus. It's a whole lot easier. And even with my ULS, it was. And um, it kind of is, but since I use the camera so much and I calibrate the camera wow. to the focal point of that autofocus, um, that way I don't have to calibrate my camera so often. So I try to religiously use the autofocus. Now, of course, you know, clear, transparent, translucent, any of that kind of stuff, acrylic and that glass, that won't pick up on the sensor because it's an optical sensor and it'll pass through. So in that instance, um, you can use another material that's the same thickness, um, you know, or stack up some shims or something to make up that thickness. Then once it's focused, you can put the material back on. So. Gary, do you have a camera? Yeah. You like it? Um, not. A, I'm waiting on the new light burn camera to come in. Okay. Um, I bought a, I got a five millimeter or a five megapixel camera, and I don't. I'm trying to do some pretty intricate things with my camera, like positioning, and I don't think the five megapixel is quite enough to do what I want it to do. I, I do not have a camera. Um, I'm I'm considering it, but so far I haven't seen the need for one. 
Uh, I do, like I said, I do a lot of those. I do a lot of those basswood rounds, and positioning. You can position the image exactly where you want it on the round because some of them aren't round. They're, you know, oval or have a weird bump out on them, and it it's a lifesaver. I can put it in and send the job the first time and not have to, you know, keep doing frame and adjust and frame and adjust. Yeah, the way I would approach that is uh, I'd put a dot, assuming you're indexing from the center, I'd put a dot on the piece of wood, drop it on the table, line it up with the red dot on the laser, and then push the origin button and go. It's going to be perfect. But if it's if it's perfectly round, it will be. But if it's some kind of odd shape and you have your image um, oh, I got you. Okay, sure. Set to that shape, it won't. Uh, it won't let you do that. You know what I mean? It's not as accurate. Okay, I, I see. I'm thinking framing, and 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 you're actually looking at the image superimposed on the substrate. Right. Correct. Okay. So, like, if I wanted to engrave this on this wood, and I didn't have a lot of room. You know, I could find a way to make it fit and just place it right on there and that way take up for spaces. You know, that that's one example. And like he said, he can have all those all those slices laid across there and, you know, just haphazardly on the bed and then just go line the artwork on them. You don't have to worry about where they're centered or where they're placed. And uh, I've seen some people use the trace function uh, to cut out pieces to go back in other pieces so you can trace this as well uh, now, on uh, on your cut settings uh, or your engraved settings you've got line and then you've got line plus fill mm -hmm. and um, why would you use line plus fill um, for, so for example let's say you wanted to engrave some text but you wanted it to be really really super sharp so that's what we're looking at let me get in a little closer so you, we, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to change the power of of the line itself. It just kind of rides sure. along with your settings on the on no, the no. other. No, if you if no, you, you can uh, if you go to cuts and layers and you choose line plus fill, and then you go into your settings. There's your fill settings, which we let's say about three hundred, not three thousand, not on this machine, but on the other one, ten and ten. Stop showing off. And then uh, there's your line settings right here. So yeah, you don't want to you don't want to cut probably. You just want to you know help it along. So maybe 200, something like that at 10 and 10. And then if we look at the preview, the preview will show you. Oh, it's not set to output. Is that what you were trying to tell me, Awesome? No, it's something else. But Mark, it's, uh, just do a couple of samples yourself. You'll see how sharp the letters come out with the line fill. I, I did, but uh, what I what I noticed was that it 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 was there was so much power there that it actually burned up the. Ah, then you're setting right there what Brian is showing you. You need to adjust those slightly. Yeah, I didn't see that. Good. Okay. Here's your line settings right here. So and yeah, you can, as fast as those you line can run settings it. are 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 uh, just for the line plus fill uh, function. Just for the line part of the line plus fill, yes. Okay. Because you yeah, have fill fill settings, up on line top, settings because so. it's going to do both of them. Yeah. So. Hey Brian, just switch over to the line real quick uh, from the mode and just show them what it looks like. Yeah, see, then all you have is line. Control. Oh, okay. And then the same with fill. It just it combines them into one process so you don't have so many layers to deal with. Oh, I guess it would help if I click over here. See, then you just have fill. And these are these are grayed out because you don't have line plus fill. So then once you, once you do that, these aren't grayed out anymore. You can use them. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, does anybody have anything else? 
if not, not for now. Hey, I may shut this one down. I got a I got a little one with clay here in a few minutes. I need to get ready for, and uh, I'll trim this stuff up a little bit and stick it up on YouTube and add it to our learning module. Or maybe I'll just put it up raw. I'll see how it looks. Maybe I won't have to edit. That takes more time than doing the video. So I'm gonna stop recording. Cool. Thank you, Brian.